Hello, I'm Locke Meredith, and I'd like to invite you to join me on the next Leo Lines. We're very pleased to have on the show our United States Senator David Vitter. He's a Republican. He's been in the Senate for almost six years. He's going to talk to us about several issues. One, the health care plan, the debt that we have as a country, and many other issues. So join us on the next Legal Lines with United States Senator David Vitter. Want to learn the secret to big savings on TV, internet, and phone? It's bundling your services with Cox. When you bundle with Cox, you get digital cable, high-speed internet with power boost, and telephone. All for one low monthly price. That's three fantastic services at one low price that will make you smile. The secret is out. The more you bundle, the more you save. So get a whole lot and save a whole lot when you bundle with Cox. Cox knows the key to getting the most out of the internet, speed. Which is why we're committed to always providing you with blazing fast speeds for all of your internet needs. Cox High Speed Internet is simply faster than DSL, and it has Power Boost, an extra surge of speed to help you download videos, pictures, and large files all in the blink of an eye. Something you can't get from the phone company's internet service. So buckle up and surf the web at speeds you've only imagined with Cox High Speed Internet. Welcome to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and I'm extremely pleased to have on the show today our United, United States Senator David Vitter. David, thank you so much thank for being you, on Locke. the show. Thank you, Locke. It's a real it. pleasure for me to be here. Thanks well, for the invite. Well, thank you. Been looking forward to it. Uh, glad you didn't have to fly in through the rain. We just went through. Yeah, got in last night. So. Great. Well, uh, very interesting times. Uh, it is. Almost a year to the date, we right. witnessed one of the most extraordinary events in American history, and that right. was the inauguration of President Barack Obama. You were there. Yep. Tell the folks about it. Well, I have the honor, of course, to sit on the Capitol not far from where he was sworn in, looking out along the mall, literally from the Capitol to the Washington Monument, beyond to the Lincoln Memorial. Extraordinary. Oh, it was. There were people millions. everywhere, uh, millions and millions of people, undoubtedly the biggest crowd ever for any inauguration. And obviously it was so historic, first African-American president. And I didn't vote for President Obama, but I certainly uh, was very joyful in celebrating that historic event. I, I think mean, all meant, of America was. Yeah, absolutely. It meant so much to have overcome the obvious history of slavery and racism and be there for that moment. So Pretty wonderful. it was very, very special. So I forgot about policy for a day <laughs> and just tried to enjoy that. Well, here we are a year later. Right. And you were sitting in the Congress uh, just a few days ago with uh, 99 other senators, right. uh, the House of Representatives and the United States Supreme Court, right. and President Obama gave his first State of the Union. Right. What did you think? Well, first of all, I was tempted to do one of those shout outs from the audience like a year ago, but it wasn't going to be real political. It was just going to be who dat. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, um, I was really eager. You know, we all know the president is a great speaker. Truly. I was really eager to see how well he's been listening and how good a listener he is, because I think the American people have been uh, speaking loudly and clearly about some things. And quite frankly, I was, I was disappointed. On the positive side for me, he did focus on spending and debt, which is a huge problem. It is a big deal. And he did pledge some action there. He talked about this freeze in spending. It's very modest when you look at the details, but look, I'll take any start. I'll support that freeze. I want to go much further, but we have to start somewhere. I'll certainly support that freeze and go further. On the other side of the coin, to me, he, he really sort of dug in his heels and was very defensive about bailouts and continuing TARP rather than ending the TARP program, which I want to do, about the stimulus, uh, which I think was a was trillion dollars largely Waste. wasted. We're still at 10% unemployment. In Louisiana, our unemployment is much lower, but last month we had the fastest growing unemployment of any state in the country. Well, I think the promise was is that if that was passed, right. uh, unemployment would be no higher than 8%. Right. We're at 10% now and it's predicted to go to 10.5. Yeah, it could. And once we come out of this recession, right. uh, to be what, a jobless recovery in a lot of senses. Yeah, and that's the concern. And then finally, about his version of health care. You know, he was still dug in, defending and talking about his version of health care when I really, really believe most Americans want a new start, a different approach. Well, let's talk about um, the uh, whether or not 
the democratic control of, of the Congress and the administration at the White House heard uh, the people speak when the election of Senator Brown-elect occurred in Massachusetts. Right, right. What do you well, think? Well, we'll see over the next few weeks. Uh, the good news for me is uh, it doesn't matter whether they heard or not, going from 60 votes of any party in the Senate to 59 is a big change so that that party cannot, by definition, just do whatever they want because and almost everything takes 60 votes in the Senate. So at the end of the day, if you really want a bipartisan approach, I think the way to produce it is to have numbers that require it <laughs> so that nothing big is going to pass without some level of bipartisanship. Well, explain to the folks uh, how it works, because the bottom line is the Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. Right. They had a, a great majority there, and they right. had a supermajority in the Senate, right. and they had the White House. Right. And so the bottom line is they didn't need a single Republican right. to pass a single bit of legislation. Right, exactly. Period. Yeah, and I think, um, again, everyone talks about bipartisanship. I think the way you, you actually produce it in Washington is to have numbers in the Congress that require it. For the last year, we haven't had that. Big majority in the House, and the House is a simple majority institution. Period. So if you have a majority of one, you do whatever you want. In the Senate, uh, it isn't a simple majority institution. Almost everything requires 60 votes. But the Democrats, when Arlen Specter switched parties, had 60 votes. And of course, they had the president. So until recently, they could virtually do what they wanted and were taking that approach with health care. Well, let me ask you this question, because I had uh, Congressman Bill Cassidy yeah. in uh, a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. and he basically indicated that, at least on the House side, mm -hmm. they didn't communicate with the Republicans mm -hmm. at all. They right. were not allowed to participate. Is right. that what you experienced on the Senate side? Yeah, unfortunately it is. Uh, I mean, you know, there are nice speeches, and the president talked about reaching out uh, again a few days ago, uh, that's great, but you know what matters is what the practice is. And, and unfortunately, healthcare was a perfect example. There was no meaningful incorporation of Republican approaches. Uh, the proof of that is that the final bill on the Senate floor didn't get a single Republican vote, including someone like Olympia Snow. You know, Olympia Snow and I are both Republicans, but we couldn't be more different. I mean, Olympia is significantly more liberal than a lot of Democrats, certainly in Louisiana, even some in Washington, and yet they couldn't earn her vote. Uh, so it really wasn't any move to the middle or any truly bipartisan push. And the election of Senator-elect Brown in Massachusetts was uh, even a louder scream, it seems, because sure. that was the seat held by the deceased Senator Ted Kennedy for right. 49 years. Yeah. And as I understand it, it is, the, I guess, the most Democratic state in the Union. Yeah. yeah. And they elected a Republican. Yeah. To me, the statement couldn't have been louder or clearer. Here you have Massachusetts, very liberal state electing a Republican to the U.S. Senate to replace Ted Kennedy in the middle of the debate on his lifetime signature issue. Uh, and clearly, the people of Massachusetts, like around the country, were saying, time out. We don't like this lurch to the left. We don't like these corrupt deals to pass a bill. We want a do-over, a start-over, a different approach. And, and the, the increase in power or the requirement now that the Democrats uh, involve the Republican Party in the process mm -hmm. is because uh, Senator-elect mm -hmm. Brown was in fact elected and that gives y'all basically 41 senators as I right. understand it. Again, in the Senate, almost everything, there are some exceptions, we can get to that, but almost everything takes 60 votes. So obviously with 59 Democrats, they can't do whatever the heck they want. They have to involve some Republicans to pass anything. Hopefully they're going to take that requirement seriously and, and really go the extra mile. And, and has the, the Senate leadership reached out to the Republicans? Um, you know, it's, it's slowly beginning to happen. We're, we're going to have to see. It hasn't happened in, All right. in, in, a, in a big way yet, but we'll see. Well, let's keep talking about that sure. on the next segment. This is Legal Lines with Locke Meredith and United States Senator David Bitter. We'll be right back. Everybody loves on demand from Cox. Well, did you know the love's about to grow? 
Soon, your on-demand menu will have a whole new look, making it easier than ever to find your favorite shows, access hundreds of movies, and thousands of free programming choices, even HD. Just like that, so you can watch what you want to watch, when you want to watch it. It just keeps growing better every day. See what's coming on demand and get more out of what you're into with Cox Digital Cable. Welcome back to Legal Lines. I'm Locke Meredith, and again, extremely pleased to have our United States Senator David Vitter on the show. Again, David, thanks for being on thanks, the show. Locke. Um, it seems that Massachusetts and frankly the whole nation is yelling, economy and jobs. Right. Fix it. Right. And uh, it's interesting that your education has really prepared you for this time in history. Tell the folks a little bit about your educational background. Well, I hope so. I grew up in Louisiana, went to schools here, mostly Catholic schools in South Louisiana. Then for uh, college, I went away to Harvard undergrad and mostly studied history. And then I thought I would go to law school, but before that I was uh, very blessed to win a Rhodes Scholarship. And so I studied for two years at Oxford in England and studied uh, modern history and economics. Fantastic. And really focused on economics. And that does prove useful. I'm no economic scholar, but it does prove useful in terms of these issues today. And then I came full circle back home to Tulane Law School. And practiced uh, for a brief period of time, and then, yeah. as I understand, it's in the state legislature, right. uh, then the first district in Congress, right. and then were elected in 2004, historically, uh, the first Republican senator in the history of this state. Yeah, elected by the people. We had a Republican senator in Reconstruction, so there was a bit of a gap A carpetbagger yeah, yeah, I guess. A bit uh, of a gap, and back then, senators were chosen by the state legislature. So I'm the first to be elected by the people. If we had that old rule of state legislatures choosing senators, I would definitely not be in the, <laughs> in the Senate. Well, and the other unique thing was is there was no runoff. Right, right. Uh, we had the open primary system. Since then, it's changed for federal elections. But at the time, we had the open primary system. And I was able to win without a runoff. So tell the folks what you would do with your background and your history and your expertise to deal with uh, the 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 devastating economy we're in right now and the joblessness. Right. Well, well, three sort of obvious points. First of all, we need to focus on jobs and the economy as job one. You know, it demands discipline and focus, and the president hasn't been doing that, unfortunately. He's been doing a lot of things, most obviously health care in the last four months, but he hasn't been focused like a laser beam on jobs and the economy. Now they say, the they, they say that they've saved or created two million jobs. What is your view on that? Well, uh, you know, I voted against the stimulus because I thought it was a lot of wasteful spending. And I wish I had been proven wrong over the last year. Uh, I don't think I have. Counting interest, it, is, it will have spent over a trillion dollars. And, and I'm sure it's produced some jobs at the margin. I mean, you can't spend half a trillion that much dollars money and not, and not do somebody. something. But, you know, they said unemployment reach, never reach 8%, like you said, it's over 10%. Uh, they're counting all these uh, jobs that would have been lost otherwise. You know, I, I don't know exactly how you count that or calculate that. It's sort of like the, uh, the uh, event that never occurred. So I, I think it mostly wasted a lot of taxpayer dollars. Well, you know, I think we need a fundamentally different approach and uh, I've come together with many colleagues around a bill we call the no-cost stimulus plan that is energy-based to open up our domestic resources, create more good-paying energy jobs here. That doesn't cost taxpayer dollars. In fact, it creates new revenue because once you produce more domestically, revenue comes into the federal government. And in the bill, we also devote some of that new revenue to uh, new green alternative energy R&D. Well, and, and, and as I understand it, we're saying unemployment is 10%, could go to 10.5%, right. but when you include folks who have oh, either yeah. quit looking for a job or right. who are underemployed, right. it's really 17% or more. Correct. Extraordinary. Yeah. yeah, the Labor Department has a very narrow definition of unemployment. And you're right, a lot of folks have, have quit looking, a lot of folks are underemployed, when you add all that together, the figure is much higher in, in terms of people who really want to work a whole lot more. Well, the, the other thing um, that interested me when you were talking about the energy component of right. your plan, because that's really also a national security Absolutely. Uh, issue, big Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Yeah, particularly post 9-11. And unfortunately, this administration is going in the opposite direction. 
uh, making us more dependent on foreign sources, even as we face enemies who control many of those foreign sources. Bottom line is we're buying their oil and yeah. sending them our money, yeah. and some of and those folks are funding people that want yeah. to kill us. That is the single biggest source of bankrolling the, the terrorist war against us. What is your view of the way the administration in, in Congress is handling um, the attacks against our country with, say, the Christmas Day bomber, yeah. uh, the New York trials? Yeah. I am I very don't opposed. It. I'm very opposed to those policies. You know, the Christmas Day bomber is a perfect example. Here's here's a guy. Uh, first of all, not a U.S. citizen. Th exactly. A, That's a, foreign, a big deal. A, yes, a big distinction. A foreign national, clearly an act of war, trying to blow up a plane. When they landed in Detroit, thank thank God it didn't blow up. They arrest him. It's interesting that apparently he talked to our agents and gave a lot of valuable information, and then. Shortly into it, a few days, the administration decided, time out, he needs a U.S. taxpayer-funded lawyer, and he needs to be read his Miranda rights. So he was literally given a lawyer at our expense and literally told, quote, you have the right to remain silent, and on and on. And he stopped. Quote. And surprise, surprise, he hasn't said a word since. Um, now, he's not a U.S. citizen. He does not have those constitutional rights. He's an enemy combatant at war. We have never treated enemy combatants during wartime like this, and, and we sure as heck shouldn't start now. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, closing Guantanamo, trying the 9-11 masterminds in New York. In New York. Uh, I think it's one really dangerous, not just a decision I disagree with, really dangerous decision after another, and I'm really concerned about those mounting up and I'm, I'm hearing, at least I thought I heard today, that they're actually reconsidering the New York trials. I hope they are. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg yesterday came out against it. He said security will cost New York City a billion dollars, and even if we can spend the billion dollars, it's a bad idea. Because of that, one of his U.S. senators, Chuck Schumer, who's generally a very reliable ally of the Obama administration, I think is going to side with the mayor. So hopefully that's beginning to change some things, we'll see. Um, how do you view the prosecution of the war in Iraq and Afghanistan? Well, um, you know, things have improved dramatically in Iraq, going back to the surge, so that's great. And, and I am going to be the first one to celebrate and applaud as our servicemen and Amen. women come home. It's going to take some time, but that should be able to happen over time. Afghanistan is a big challenge. Uh, it, it's just a tough situation. It was tough for the Bush administration. It's tough for this administration. I applaud the president for making the commitment of extra focus and extra troops. He del deliberated for a while, but he got there, and I applaud that. Uh, we just need to, to uh, go through with it. The one thing about his announcement that I was uh, wary about is he essentially gave a date certain that we would start right. to pull out. And I think that is a, a bad signal, both to our enemies and to our allies, that we don't necessarily have the staying power. Now, I hope it doesn't take that long, but I don't think you should announce a date certain at the beginning of the effort. Let's continue this discussion on the next segment. This is Lock Mayor of the Legal Lines, and our United States Senator David Bitter will be right back. Did you know that high-def programming from Cox is free? That's right. Cox gives you a ton of HD channels for no additional cost. Your favorite HD channels, your local channels in HD, and even more HD choices with on-demand and more being added every day. So get a whole lot more HD for a whole lot less with Cox Digital Cable. Some people still don't have on-demand from Cox. Impersonators. Who oh, you calling an impersonator, pal? No, 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 you insulted him a little bit. A little bit? A little bit. Uh, is there a reason you all aren't using on-demand from Cox? Because I thought you guys would love access to thousands of movies and shows. The stars don't like to watch. No, they're all movies. It's tacky. Mm, did I mention a lot of it's free? Free is hot. <laughs> Boom. On-demand from Cox. Perfect for almost everyone. Welcome back to Legal Lines. 
I'm Locke Meredith, and again, very pleased to have on the show our United States Senator David Bitter. David, again, thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Locke. We we're talking about the economic issues and, and a plan that you and several other uh, Republican senators have presented. Hopefully, it'll be listened to. Right. Let's talk about the other issue, and that right. is the amount of spending that Absolutely. has taken place this year. It's Absolutely. unbelievable, unprecedented. Yeah. Two days ago, Congress increased the debt ceiling. I voted against that because we weren't really doing anything to slow down debt. But, but Congress had to increase the overall debt ceiling because the old ceiling, which was over $12 trillion, wasn't, wasn't enough. Trillion with a T. So they increased it by almost another $2 trillion. I mean, that's mind boggling. Uh, we have dramatically increased deficit and debt just in the last year, over a trillion dollars in the last year. And then my concern is that beyond that, uh, the Congress passed an Obama budget, I voted no, but it passed, that doubles that historic high level of debt, doubles it in five years, triples it in 10 years. So we're talking about instead of 14, 28? Oh, it, it, yeah, there's no, there's no telling where that would stop. We clearly need to turn the corner. Now the good news is the president at least acknowledged that in the State of the Union. He identified spending and debt as a huge problem. He talked about a freeze. When you look at the details, it's extremely modest. But hey, I'll, I'll take any start he can outline, and hopefully we can go further. Well, and concerning the freeze, as I understand it, it relates only to about 17% right. of the budget, and right. it really doesn't go into effect until 2011. Right, yeah. So it's not dealing with anything. It doesn't start till 2011. Last year, we had increases, certainly counting the stimulus, of in some areas 15, 20 percent. Uh, so obviously, you know, if, if you have a family budget and one year you're able to increase at 25 percent and then the next year say, oh, we're going to be tough and have a freeze, uh, you know, that, right. that, that's not necessarily really tightening your belt. Well, and I actually heard that the, the, a number to try and help people get their heads around this is that every citizen, every woman, child, yeah. man in this nation yeah. has a $40,000 debt. Yeah. that the government went out and put on a charge card and said, here, you pay it, citizen. Right. Right. That's where we are. Yeah, I have friends who, who just had a, a baby last week. That young American came into the world with that debt, In debt. over his head and that debt that's going to be tied to him eventually. And, and the concept of deficit basically means the government is not getting in the money, right. the revenues, right. to pay what they're spending. And so they're going out and borrowing money from who? whoever will buy our bonds, but that certainly includes a lot of folks outside this country like the Chinese government. And so there's big concern that uh, we're essentially getting in hock to people who aren't necessarily our friends, and the most obvious example is the Chinese government. So what do we do? Well, um, you know, when you're in a deep hole, it seems to me rule one is stop digging. Um, a pretty common sense concept. So far this year, instead of putting the shovel down, we've put the shovel down to use a backhoe. I mean, we got to stop digging. We have to have real spending control. Again, I'm glad the president talked about a freeze, but as you said, when you look at the details, it's extremely modest. So we have to do a lot, a lot more than the freeze is describing. So I hope we go a lot further in terms of spending reform. Let's talk about health care. Sure. Uh, I think folks have a general idea of what uh, President Obama and the Congress, the Democratic controlled Congress has been uh, putting forth. Um, tell them what the Republican plan is, how it differs from the Democrat plan. Right. Uh, let me start with two big differences, at least in my opinion. I think this would reflect a lot of conservatives. Uh, the Obama bill in the Senate was 2,733 pages. I don't want to pass any 2,733 page bill. I want to read a book that long. Yeah, including one written by Republicans, because even that would be full of garbage, either intended or unintended. I'd much rather do something like pass five bills. Each could be 25 pages or less, focused on, each one focused on a real problem. Like a laser beam. Yeah, like pre-existing conditions. That is a real problem. That's right. It's not an easy problem. We need to do something about it. Like the need to allow us as consumers to buy health insurance across state lines would dramatically increase choice and competition. And competition. Absolutely. Like the similar idea to allow small business to pool together across state lines. So a Baton Rouge restaurant, instead of having maybe eight people to insure, and you go to buy health insurance and you don't get any deal for eight people, 
What if they could work through the National Restaurant Association and have a large buying pool and have more of the buying power and leverage that Apple computers or Toyota has? They will get a much better deal and a much better premium. And the bottom line is, I understand it, it's really a philosophical difference where the Democrats' philosophy is give us the money, we'll spend it for you, we'll make the decision for you. Uh, and the Republican philosophy